Every generation is defined by a series of converging technologies that radically transform what we believe to be possible. For our generation, in particular, artificial intelligence is undoubtedly one of these, and it successfully crossed the chasm from science fiction to reality. Now, one of the things that I find interesting is that whenever we hear people talking about it, we hear them talking about it from one of two perspectives. On one hand, we have the dystopians who warn us of everything that can go wrong. On the other hand, we have the, utop the, yeah, the utopians who herald this endless and boundless possibilities that we have through it. But what both of these are missing out is that there are two sides of the same narrative, this man versus machine narrative. And the rate of change is just accelerating. And we're missing out on the fact that this, these disruptive technologies are outpacing our own adaptability. Now, let's take a step back and think about chess. Chess is my favorite sport. Yes, it is a sport. And my favorite piece is the knight, because it allows you to strategically put your opponent in a position that they do not want to be on. It's called the fork. And this is a position that will net you a positive gain in material. Now, the surprising fact about it is that over 70% of grandmaster level chess matches end in a draw. Why is that? Well, it happens to be that it's something that's completely able to be optimized. And the most iconic moment in this narrative of man versus machine, at least for me, uh, was Deep Blue versus Gary Kasparov. Now, Gary had a very precarious situation. He was eventually going to lose, right? Because it's a game that would be highly optimized. And Deep Blue played to his strengths. It was just waiting for Gary to make a mistake. He won the first match in 1996, but in 1997, he lost. Now, the interesting part and why I mentioned chess is because of what happened afterwards. So we had the advent of centurions, which were teams of chess engines and humans fi fighting against another human and a chess engine. And this is a clear way of how we should look at the future of every industry and every function. Because the fact of the matter is that human plus machine is in the future. It's actually the present. If you work in marketing, finance, or logistics, you know what I'm talking about. You might not be aware of it, but you're probably already using artificial intelligence for your work. So I got into programming because I like video games and I wanted to make a video game myself. And when thinking about what is an example that's going to be clear for everyone, it's going to convince you to actively look for a way that you can use artificial intelligence in your business or just in your everyday life. And I decided to go for the hardest thing I could think about and everyone in the field would agree on, which is creativity. It is this final frontier, the last bastion of humanity, and what we define as a thing that, well, machines will never be able to do that. Or will they? Now, I tend to work a lot with language and natural language processing. Basically, it's we look at the structure of language and we try to teach machines how to not only understand it, but how to create it. And it turns out that music and language have very similar structures. After all, music is much more than just organized noise, in the same way that language is a lot more than just organized words. Now, I went back, looked at 2017, they published a paper, and it's called the MuseGAN, and it's a framework on how we can use a generative adversarial network to generate music. Um, one of the most important parts in every artificial intelligence project that you undertake is what data you use to train it. So I found a training data set that was a lot of files, probably more than I could even write myself or a human being in general when they're trying to learn music. Uh, the other part that's really important was what inputs am I going to give it once this is already trained? So I settled down on four inputs, which were chords, style, medley, and groove. For all the geeks in the room, this is a very basic overview of how the network works, but this is not what I'm going to focus on today. Rather, let's listen to a little bit of music that I was able to generate with AI. Now, this is the first approach, was basically just feeding it uh, an input to a pre-trained network, and let's see what it came out with. So jazz is a genre that I think was a low-hanging fruit because it's not the most structured. And you can just be jamming, and it might not sound the best, but you still recognize it as music. So let's hear what came out. This is around 250 uh, MIDI files down the line that I had to listen to. So let's take a listen. Not perfect, right? It sounds like jazz, but there's something off about it. And no matter how hard I tried, there was something that was missing. And when I talked to my friends who work in the field, because when you are stuck in something as human beings, what do you do? Well, you ask the next smartest person you know. And this is a phrase that one of them told me that it just 
really blew my mind because I was going at this from the wrong way. And it's as our circle of knowledge grows, so does the perimeter of our ignorance. And I was looking at this from a completely wrong perspective. I was standing here surrounded by this endless possibilities. Like this algorithm could just generate music on demand. I just gave it something and I just like spit out things. I could feel the same thing. It wouldn't output the same thing a second time. Or if it did, it was slightly different. And I wasn't doing what, I, what they did in chess, right? So what if I just apply this centurion approach to music? Because I was literally just feeding it something and expecting it to be music, right? I mean, what could go wrong? So um, I decided to take on the role of human as a creative director and focus on what I was actually doing well, right? Come up with an initial melody, focus on sound mixing and instrument selection. Now, I do have to admit, I wasn't a musician in the beginning. I don't think I'm a musician now, but I did have to take a little bit of classes on basically musical production so that I could take this to the next level. Now, what I did is that I started taking together the pieces and telling my algorithm what sounded well, what didn't sound well for humans, right? The audience is what makes, in the end, this interesting or not. So this was the birth of, well, this is my gamer tag, but I couldn't find a better one, but it's Nexus, right? So it's GAN Powered Tunes. And uh, this is the first of the outputs. And single instrument, I started to go, I didn't do much editing here, but let's listen to how much it improved when I just literally just changed the order and the mindset that I had going into it. So if you haven't been in Austin in the summer, this is one of the most iconic things where you see, you're gonna see blue bonnets. Now, this was a lot better. I don't know about you, but at least I found that, it, okay, once I let it do its own thing and let it breathe, we started getting better results. So uh, in the spirit of today's topic and whole event, I started to think about, okay, so what does the future sound like, right? If I just let go of having this idea that music has to be a certain way or a certain structure, let's play to each other's strengths. And uh, so this is the first sample, and I want you to think about like, one of my favorite albums in all my life is Daft Punk's Random Access Memories. So if you hear a little bit of Daft Punkish, like it's deliberate, because I think that that's the closest thing to what I think that future human music is gonna sound like. So let's take a listen to the second one. Now, I had to come up with a new genre because I didn't think it was just ambient music, it wasn't soundtrack. Now, the closest thing that I could find, because a lot of friends asked me, so what is this, right? It's not jazz, it's not classical music. The closest thing I could come up with, and this will probably evolve over time, was calling it bionic music. Why? Because it truly is the combination, I couldn't call it centaur music, right? This, this, bionic music has that futuristic feel, but also it's rooted in the fact that I'm a human and I have lost all of these songs do have heavy editing, but they're nowhere near perfect. Now, what happens when we take this concept and we take it slightly further? This next song, I gave it a melody, and I think it's the one that I very strongly looked for all the samples that kept the melody as intact as I originally put it. So if I'm being a stubborn human being and I wanna have this music sound as close to human music, we get this.
Sounds different, right? So when you start playing to one another's strengths, you get different results. And this is more a lesson in human creativity than it is on machine intelligence. And one of the biggest lessons that I had throughout this process is that if we stop looking for greater horizons, we might as well be machines. Because that is what defines humanity for me, right? Always looking for that next horizon. Once we reach the top, that summit, we're going to keep going. And this last song, um, I think, has a little bit of both. I up, it's a setting that you put on your network, and I up the temperature all the way to the top, meaning this is as close to what it is, more the machine doing most of the work, and me just fixing a little bit of the volume and choosing the right instruments. Here we go. One of the surprising things about this is this is not even the tip of the iceberg because these are still software instruments. You can still add another layer by having humans actually play these same songs. And what, are the, what other layers are we going to uncover with this? So in case any of you want to hear to the full unedited track, uh, I love space and I love that I gave it this topic. So I made eight tracks, eight planets in our solar system. Uh, you can just go to uh, Nexus.xyz. Right now it just points to SoundCloud, but as I keep going forward and I take this even further, I'm going to update with a blog. I documented most of this process and I'll try to put most of these fully open source so you can use this if you want to make a home video or anything. These are completely copyright free, which I think is, for a lot of the music industry, it's scary, but everyone has access to these tools. Right now, it's a user interface problem. I know how to program, I've worked with language, and I could just translate those skills over to music. Now, I don't consider myself a musician even now because I still believe that the machine was doing most of the work. So where do we go from here, right? Are we going to completely change what we define as humanity? Is creativity gone and now computers can do it? No. And this is where I want all of you to think about it. Just because I put AI into music doesn't mean that music is gone. It just changed. It transformed. And that is where I believe I was wrong in the beginning. Our adaptability is still there. It's just that we need to be open to working alongside. And going back to Centaur Chess, do you know who won the most of those matches when you had those competitions? It wasn't even the grandmasters with the better chess engines. It was actually the amateur players that happened to actually trust the recommendations the chess engine was giving them, to them. So um, your move. And I just hope that all of you think about AI and your relationship to technology in general with your everyday work. Thank you very much.